Rahman Rahim Alhamdulillah wa sallallahu ala nabi rumi assalamu alaikum It starts off with a nice story uh, uh, One shaykh he mentions someone came to him and started uh, staying more, living more time with him around the shaykh and in those days you can imagine like a shaykh living close to a mosque or whatever and he worships a lot so somebody starts sitting close to him a lot and starts wanting to learn something from him. So the Sheikh mentioned that you come often to me, but what, but what's making you come? So the guy opened up, started talking to him. So he said, oh, I found out you know how to do chemia. Chemia was, I think, a, a science or a, yeah, a chemical reaction where you can turn other metals into gold. I see. Okay. Yeah, uh, but this English is a very specific term in English. I'm forgetting the name. <coughs> alchemy. All right. I think it's alchemy, yeah. <coughs> so, yeah. So, the guy said, oh, so you came for that. But I don't think you'll be... Then the, the discussion continues. Okay, yeah, so I got it. Okay, so the, the guy said to him that you won't be able to learn alchemy from me. He's like, why? He's like, well, basically alchemy, I think he says this, he says basically alchemy is understanding that creation is two types. One, those who love us and those who hate us. Those who hate us, they can't really harm us unless if Allah has allowed that much harm. And uh, those who we love, they won't be able to benefit us more than how much Allah has allowed for us to be benefited by them. So when I look at those who I love and those who I hate, they both become nothing to me over time. Because they can only do whatever Allah allowed. So the, those who we love can only love us as much as Allah wants us to be benefited with their love. And those who harm us will also be harming us only the amount that Allah has allowed, which He has destined. And that's where the hadith comes in. Uh, I think it was Ibn Abbas, <coughs> that his Nabi Sallallahu young uncle, young cousin, Nabi Sallallahu told him that if all of mankind was to get together to harm you, they cannot harm you except whatever Allah has allowed. And if everybody gets together to benefit you, they will only be able to benefit you the amount that Allah has allowed. So these are the kind of things that over time a person becomes very calm or even cold towards people because he sees them as weak. If that makes sense. As time passes by, a person becomes cold towards some people because he becomes emotionally so mature he knows those who give him love can only give that much love. He can't give more, mm -hmm. even if they wanted to. For example, let's just say you have a child who's 20 year old. And he can only say, love you on Eid day. That's it. And all year he's too busy to talk to you. So can he give you more love? No, he just so caught up in dunya. So over time, you see them as helpless people. And uh, those who give us love sometimes, they need us sometimes too. So it's like a double relationship, they need something from you anyways. So over time, it's possible that a person becomes a little cold towards the world. Although it's, it's more like a psychological understanding of the world, that doesn't mean we should become cold. We shouldn't become cold towards the world, <coughs> but there should be a deep understanding of what's happening at least. And the last thing I can share is uh, selfless love. Selfless love, meaning uh, unconditional love. Unconditional love only comes from parents. <laughs> Everybody else loves us because of something. That's the weird thing about it. Like Only parents know how to give selfless love, <coughs> unconditional love, where they want you to benefit. But after that, marriage, friends, and children. They love us, but they'll get something back. So it's a both-sided love. So it's like a partnership. 
they give love, you give love, and you're both happy. When it comes to parents, they give love, and we just we are happy. In the sense, so parents are the only one that are so unique in their love. Otherwise, other people is mostly like a sim. They call it symbiotic relationship. Scientifically, they use that term, meaning where both ben both parties benefit. Bidirectional. Yeah, bidirectional exactly. So the quotation for today was very deep. He says that disgrace is uh, not found except in the seeds of hope or greed. Mm. Yeah, the seeds. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the disgrace is not found except in the seeds of greed. In other words, as long as a person has greed towards something, he's willing to humble himself for it. But if he becomes not in need of it, he doesn't have to disgrace himself for that one thing. For example, money. People do so much for money. They see somebody who has more money, they're gonna start sucking up to him, be nice to him, act disgraceful in front of him, act humble in front of him. But if once you switch, switch your mind and say, no, I don't need his money, suddenly your honor comes back. For example, a Hollywood star walks by and suddenly greed comes in like, oh, I need his autograph. But then once you tell yourself, no, but I don't need his autograph, I'm fine. Suddenly there's no, you don't have to humble yourself to him. So whatever, they say you, are a <clears throat> you become a slave to whatever you want so badly in life. And the more we lose interest in things, the more we become owners of them. They don't own us. That's why even they say women, if you don't give them attention, they feel shocked, like what? Like especially even like stray women, and people are walking on the street, if they dress really provocatively, and you don't look at them, they're confused, like huh? I walked in front of this guy, he didn't look at me, he's just looking at the floor. What's wrong with this guy? Because the way they're dressed, they want you to be interested. Mm. But when you don't act interested, they're shocked because you're like, how independent is this guy? How independent, how mentally strong is this person that he doesn't have a need towards looking at an attractive figure? So suddenly you were almost a slave, but now you become a king because you conquered your desires. There's a beautiful saying, uh, between Yusuf alayhi salam and the lady that tried to have bad relationships with him, she goes. She was from a kingly family mm. and she became a slave, and he be was a slave and he became a king. Because of greed and uh, desires, so desire takes a king and makes him a slave, makes him low quality citizen, oh. and somebody who's a slave, by controlling their desire, they become leaders. So that's how the world is also, the more we show interest in dunya, money, fame, leadership, the more harder it becomes to achieve it, and the more we become in need of it. And the more we show lack of interest towards these fancy things or these unnecessary things, then the more free we become and the, more dis the less disgraced we become. Although I hope it doesn't mean that we don't show love to our loved ones. Especially the, the very dependent ones, like young kids, seniors, our old parents, those people, they need that love. We don't want to act all philosophical around them because they are in need. But anybody beyond that need, we should have some type of an independence towards them. And I think a very good example of this is when poor people find wallets full of lots of money. If they're very self-respecting people, they'll be like, oh, I found your wallet here, here. They'll run after you and give it to you. But if you give them money, they say, oh, I don't want your money. I just, because they want to give to you. They have so much self-respect. They only know how to give you your money, even though you lost it. They're like, oh, I'll give it to you. But if you start giving money, say, oh, don't disrespect me. I didn't do it for the money. I did it because you need me, so I gave you help. You don't give me help, I give you help. And that's why there was a beautiful story I shared in a little while ago. 
where I think somebody back home in India or Bangladesh somewhere, a person lost a lot of expensive things. I think cameras, it was a non-Muslim person, he lost a lot of camera, expensive recording devices. And uh, <coughs> once the taxi driver, he found it, he gave it back to him. And the guy said, oh, I want to give you money. He said, oh, no, I don't want money. You come to my house, have some tea with me. So the person wanted to give more to the, per to the person who wants to give him reward. So that's what richness does. Mental richness, it just makes a person very independent. He doesn't see need. And the only time that need is there, if it's this greed, a person wants to get somewhere, he starts acting more and so on. But if a person becomes independent, he doesn't have to lower himself to anything. That's where Islam is such a powerful tool. It just makes a person so dependent on Allah that it frees you from culture, from uh, trends, fashions. It just frees you slowly, slowly. So if somebody tells you, oh, the Canadian culture is you do this, you dress and you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. Or the whatever country you're from, their culture is this, you better do that. You're like, oh, I don't need to do that culture. I just follow the sunnah, I'm fine. And people in this field do it this way. The doctors do it like this, and the so-and-so does it like that. You're like, yeah, but I don't have to copy them. That's what is a beautiful poetry. I think Alama Iqbal, he's a very famous poet. He once said that this one sajda to Allah it frees you from a thousand other prostrations in life to other things. Mm, it's powerful. Yeah, you go this one sajda and submitting yourself to the Lord, it frees you from so many slaveries. That's why I think one woman, she, when she became Muslim, <coughs> she said the day I put on the hijab and all this long clothing, she goes, I freed, I felt freed finally. Because they, and people that live in very loose cultures and loose, like very messed up clothing, they feel like they have to dress like that because the society wants them to dress like that. So if a woman wore long sleeves on a hot day, they're like, what are you doing? We're less clothed. So she is enslaved by the, mo by the society and the fashion statements. So this is more non-Muslim, when she became Muslim, she's like, oh, finally I, free f I feel freed because now I don't have to listen to what the people told me what to do. I can dress the way I want. And that's why we were talking earlier before the, we started recording the clothing. Like people feel pressured to dress awkwardly in the summer because everybody else is wearing such less clothing. So it's a peer pressure to do so much wrong because if you cover up too much, somebody will tell you oh, what's wrong with your body. As if something's wrong with the body, otherwise if somebody's covered, something's wrong. Something, everything's wrong. They're just healthy, they have good health and good morality. And the, the last example we can give is that rich uh, person who has gone to a saint and after sitting with him, he felt impressed by his religiousness. He went home, got some money. I, I said this story many times, he came, give him money. And the sheikh asked him, are you still working? He's like, yeah, I'm still working. He's like, okay, then you keep your money because I don't work anymore for money, I'm fine. And you're still working a lot, so you hold on to your money, you need it more, because you're trying to make it somewhere in life. I'm poor, but I'm happy, so I don't need it. So I think that's where this whole lesson is coming from. The more a person has greed, the more he has to lower himself to things. But once a person becomes independent, he doesn't. Like, look at a fasting person, yes. Let's just say there's foods being served, and uh, this one person is fasting. <coughs> and he's fine, he doesn't need to eat. He, he's not even saving for iftar time. So everybody's running like, oh, go grab, grab that, go grab that. And the fasting person is sitting there respectfully like, I don't need this. Oh, but everybody's standing, everybody's lining up for food. Don't you want it? You're like, no, I don't need it. So you have this self-respect, like I don't need it. I don't have any need for these foods that are being given. I don't have to line up, I don't have to stretch my hands to anybody. So you see how not having a need or a greed, it gives you more respect, self-respect. And this is the kind of self-respect that's felt in the brain and in the body language of people. So somebody who's feeling very strong, he can have the 
oldest clothing in a circle. But the way he walks, you're like, whew, he's walking with so much confidence, he doesn't have any need. Come on in, come. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, but it's nothing, oh. like, it's mainly for the people that are present okay, that I, I'd rather engage with them. Okay, alhamdulillah. Yeah, jazakallah khairan for joining us. So we were just talking about <coughs> greed and the, how the more a person feels dependent and he wants to get something, he has to lower himself to that. But once a person feels independent and not in need of it, then he has a sense of respect for himself. He doesn't need to lower himself all the time. And that's why I was speaking about circles, where a person can have old clothing on, but because he has so much self-respect and he doesn't feel the need to have as much money as other people in the circle, he doesn't have to lower himself. And, uh, but if somebody's influenced by the money of other people, then you'll see him humbling himself to reach people saying assalamu alaikum because oh, this uncle has a lot of money so I gotta talk to him like this because he owns a few shops so why do we do that little assalamu alaikum to richer people because psychologically we feel like oh he has so much more than me but if we get rid of that suddenly we're equals I'll give him respect he's older than me that's it I'm not going to bow my shoulders and my face and do half a ruku to him because he has a few shops or a few homes. Does that make sense? So that's how <coughs> the more uh, free a person is up here in the heart and mind and soul, then the less he has to enslave himself. And the hadith mentions al-ghina, ghina nafs al kamaqal the richness, well that's richness of the soul. Richness is richness of the soul. And because it's not about a number, you made this number of money, so now you're rich. No, richness is the moment you feel like you have enough. You have enough, so you're, you're done. Ali Adi Adilano has an amazing story when he was in need of food, so he went to a, a Jewish farmer's garden. It was a date garden. <coughs> so he, he got hired for the day to water the plants. And I think for every bucket that he was bringing in, uh, pouring, he was getting one date. But after he was done collecting a few days, that was enough for him for the day, he tried to walk away. And the person said, oh, stay around, do more watering, and uh, I need you more. He's like, oh, no, but I only need these dates. I don't need more dates, so I want to go. He's like, oh, I'll pay you more. Just stay. He's like, no, I don't need any more dates. I don't need to stay. You know what we call overtime? <laughs> so uh, I didn't want to be pressured to do overtime. And he's like, no, but I don't need more money. I don't need to stay. He's like, well, I'll give you two days per water bucket, <clears throat> three. I'll give you a handful of dates per bucket from now on. He's like, I don't need it. So he still left. So that's where like the mental richness and inner richness comes in. So may Allah give us a week to understand. And basically we're studying from... Ibn Ataullah Iskandari, he was a very wise person who had mastered the spirituality, the Islamic spirituality, so he has a book called Al-Hikam. So we're just going through that, and today's saying was, uh, disgrace uh, is not there except on the seeds of greed. So disgrace comes up onto a person, once he has this greed, then he starts lowering himself to things and so on. Well, that's what it is. May Allah give us a fit to be self-respecting. Mm -hmm. Although there will be people that might need us, so we should humble ourselves to them, like kids in our life, our kids, our nephews, nieces, whoever they are. We can humble ourselves, or even younger siblings we have. We can humble ourselves to them because they need us. But dunya and other people and rich people, celebrities, Bollywood, Hollywood, and YouTube stars, like we don't need to lower ourselves all the time to them because they're just famous people, but we don't really need anything from them. Strong? Yeah, please.